Hey guys, I hope you are excited as much as I am for the book launch next week. It's going to be Saturday, November 21st at 7pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. And it's going to be such a great opportunity to come together as a big community online because of COVID obviously, but that means everyone can come no matter whereabouts in the world you are. And it will be a great opportunity to connect, to chat, to do some activities together and even win a copy of the book if that's something that you're interested interested in. So if you're keen to come to the book launch with me and celebrate, um, just head over to lonelyconservationist.com, click the book tab and you can get your free tickets from the event back page there. And yeah, I'm just so excited to see you guys there. Grab some bubbly, some nibbly bits or toast and smoothies, whatever time zone it is, and come join the party. But before we get into the conversation, I would just like to say thank you so much for all of your incredible book and podcast reviews I am loving reading them and they are so heartwarming they make they just make me so full of emotions um I am really really privileged to have such an incredible community like you all and I'm just still in shock that something I did brought some value to people so thank you so much again and without further ado let's get into the conversation Hello and welcome back to How to Conserve Conservationist, episode 10, based on chapter 10. We are talking about the power of community. I'm Jesse, and I'm here with Todd. Hello. Imagine if the chapters didn't match the episodes. That would be so annoying. So many people (laughs) with OCD would come for me. So triggering. This is episode 10, based on chapter 14. Yeah. (laughs) Cross-reference to... (laughs) Everybody now, please turn to page 5. Yeah. This is the second to last episode, so you don't have much longer with us on our How to Conserve Conservationist podcast journey, so savour every moment of this conversation. That's my advice to you in the beginning. <laughs> well, potentially, do you think you'll make a sequel book with all the feedback you received and further life experience? I don't know. Not anytime soon, because I think everything that I didn't cover in the book, I really covered in the podcast. And I know a lot of people have been asking me if the podcast is going to continue past the 11 episodes and or if we're going to start a new podcast like based on something else. Um, I really like the idea of having this podcast really centered around the book and it being like its own entity because that means every episode we have a chapter to talk about and a topic and a theme and it's not just us talking about random stuff. Like, I like having the structure. Yeah, if if it's 100%, like, we do talk about random stuff, but if it's 100% that, it sort of starts to fall apart, I would imagine. Well, also, I don't want it to be, like, a podcast where we're just personalities that talk. I like having a reason for doing this. Like, the output for this is to, I guess I didn't realise this at the beginning, but it's to talk about things I didn't mention in the book that I think are important that I missed out but also to hear your perspective on the things that I've experienced and written about. Like, that's something that doesn't happen in the book is to hear an outsider's perspective of what goes on in the conservation industry. And I think, for me, that's a purpose. And if we just kept talking after this, <laughs> what's yeah. our purpose, really? It is surprising to me how much, like, we're a couple and we live together, but we don't, like, sit down and formally talk about these concepts and ideas you have yeah (laughs) all too often we we don't really talk about so back before lockdown and we've been in lockdown for a year now like Mm. even not lockdown like before that the fires were happening coronavirus lockdown yeah before that the fires were happening and the the levels of the atmosphere were too toxic and we couldn't go outside so we've been inside in melbourne for about a year yeah like a year straight. straight yeah so before then we used to go out for brunch and would have a coffee and would talk about things but now when we're inside all the time we're not really dedicating that much of our life to sit and have actual proper conversations with each other so this podcast has actually been good to have (laughs) structured conversations about things again um because when you're inside all the time you just get into this rut of like you're sitting on the couch you'll put on the tv you'll go read you'll do work like there's no time well, we don't make time, really, because our dinner table is not comfortable to sit at. Maybe if it was, <laughs> we would have more structured dinner table conversation. Mm. I try to create a patio space, like a beer garden in our backyard, because we can't leave the house. 
but it's like every second weekend torrential rainfall so if we have more time in the in the patio it maybe is. we can chat over a wine and a cheese platter okay it's <laughs> a good plan <laughs> Um, speaking of talking, <laughs> this um, episode is all about the power of community and basically the last chapter before the conclusion <laughs> of the book, um, basically about lonely conservationist and how it's kind of revolutionized my experience in the conservation industry and how I thought that I would have to solve everybody's problems in the beginning when I realized, oh my God, how many people experience this as well as me. There's so many people and mm. it's global. It's not just in Australia, just in Melbourne. There's people in like Uzbekistan <laughs> <laughs> and like Vanuatu that are all, like also experiencing what I experienced. And that was just very overwhelming to think I'd have to solve everybody's problems. But it turned out just having a community of like-minded people was enough to solve their problems well not solve their problems but it's all they really needed it provides is, some comfort yeah to have somebody else there who understands them um so i really want to hear from todd have you seen any difference in my conservation journey since lonely conservationist came to be and have you have you noticed it like impact my my journey like what has it been looking at this whole thing erupt and happen from your perspective uh (laughs) (laughs) if it it does feel like you're less involved and interested in like traditional animal-based conservation and you've sort of uh pivoted towards conserving the actual human being conservationists. Would you say less interested when I literally took you out to dinner after I finished reading a book about cephalopods and just talked to you an hour about cephalopods? Like, I... I'm, Is that... I think that was before. That's no, what I mean, That's right? last year. When it was legal to go to dinner. Was... I've still been reading books about animals and keeping my conservation knowledge up to date, but I haven't been acting on it. Like, it hasn't been the focus of my professional life, I guess. Yeah. But in your personal life, it's meant that you have, like... 300 fairly close friends now (laughs) (laughs) just (laughs) it's interesting like i didn't have any really i didn't have a lot of friends that were sharing my values and interests before lonely conservationist like Mm. when i went to a conference i'd have this overwhelming feeling of like oh my god other people here understand me that's a good conference that's the vibe you want yeah and then um now we moved to Melbourne and I could curate my friends exactly with the values and the interests that I wanted, which I recommend if you're an adult, you don't necessarily have to move cities to do this, but try and find people in your area that have similar interests and values to you. And you can do that by going on the discord page. If you go into the website and go to chat to other lonely conservationists, there's different groups in different countries and you can try and find lonely conservationists in your area and make new friends because i think i've really loved having people in my life who share my values and interests <laughs> not just me but what has it been like for you like now everyone in my life is like a conservationist so <laughs> before in adelaide you were on their plane and i was the weird one but now like you're the weird one and i'm yeah. on everyone else's plane <laughs> yeah now you've uh become a vegetarian just because the people around you it seems more normal to be the vegetarian it was actually more effort to eat meat exactly every every um what is it conference i went to was vegetarian catered every time i hang out with friends they all eat veggie so it just became like more convenient to be vegetarian (laughs) you feel like the odd one out yeah i've like got even more environmental since being here because all my hardcore all my friends are in the space that puts the pressure on yeah yeah i'm not like i don't want to say like labeling myself as vegetarian because i have this rule that if there's a food i'm very passionate about like if it's a chicken burger or something and i'm really (laughs) passionate about it i will eat it because i think you are passionate about food just in general i'm very food driven and i think i want my food to be something that i'm like really excited about and most of the time meat doesn't excite me so i'm not going to bother cooking it and using the resources or whatever when it doesn't bring me that much joy if there is a meat product that brings me overwhelming joy 
then it has value and it's worth it to me. Like it I, is worth this animal's life. I can justify the destruction <laughs> for the joy. But if you're just eating food for food and you don't have that joy, then I can't justify it. You know? <laughs> but that's just like a me thing. And also because like when I used to travel a lot before COVID, I would have like um, a mum who will adopt me in a village somewhere and I'm not I'm not going to reject what she puts on the table in front of me like I think it's really important to adjust to the community that you're in speaking of communities and um, if somebody has spent all day preparing food for you and using their local resources that is a gift that is an offering like you should be appreciative <laughs> if you can. If you uh, somehow befriend a uh, tribe of uh, people who still live by wandering and they celebrate your arrival with, like, slaughtering their one and only chicken (laughs) as, like, a massive uh, ritual, like, to turn it away and say, no, actually, I'm a vegetarian. That seems rude all of a sudden. Then the chicken will die in vain. Yeah. Well, this, like, when I... I I don't want this to be, like, a a food (laughs) episode, when I was a kid, I never really ate much meat. Like, my mum would only ever serve us fish and chicken, unless it was a bolognese, because we're Italian. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I was never... I never really ate red meat at all. When I went to Africa, we had to go out hunting with the cheetahs and, like, teach them to hunt antelope. Would bring the antelope back... Still... <laughs> That, does, that doesn't fit in with the rest of your life. <laughs> Always objection to the story. No, I like went it... here, I looked after monkeys here, and here I looked after elephants. And then was one time I just, you know, helped cheetahs hunt antelope. Yeah. Well, you have to, like, if you're going to rehabilitate something, it has to have the skills to be able to survive in the wild. Okay. So you help it to hunt. Then we bring the ant- antelope back. They eat what they want. Then we'd cut the good m- meat off for us. And then we would give... Oh. Would give the um, bones and extra bits to the hyenas, so nothing <laughs> would get wasted. But the problem is, I have this really fundamental mental block with dead animals. Like, I it's hypocritical when I eat them, but <laughs> I cannot physically touch a dead animal or dissect anything or like. There's something there. Like, they are pretty gross. It's not like just an ill thing. Like it's an actual psychological block. So to the point where when we were out um, and then the guys were like, the trackers were like, can you just help us lug this huge kudu back to the ute? And I was like, <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't want to be a dick. I, I know it would it be... It seems like such a reasonable request to I, lug the huge kudu back to the ute. <laughs> I know it would be so useful. Uh, ute is utility vehicle. Sorry, they call it Bucky in South Africa. <laughs> um but I know it would be so useful for me to participate in this and to help you, but mm. I physically cannot touch this. <laughs> There's just... Until it is cooked and ready to be put into your yeah, mouth. Yeah, but I, it's hard because, like, they, they say there's this discrepancy with meat where it's like when you're in the supermarket, you never see it as a cow, so you don't want to eat it. Like, I could recognize in that moment it was a sustainable thing to eat because if you're going to grow crops... It would use so much land. The antelope are already like so high in numbers. Cheetahs caught it. It was like there was no bit of that antelope that was wasted. Yeah, it wasn't being decadent. And... No. So it's weird that I could eat that antelope. I could not touch that antelope when it was a dead antelope. <laughs> it just grossed out. Yeah. So anyway, roast me all you want about not being a purist. But I think... Yeah, but <laughs> being, being in this community is a sort of change what's normal to you i think yeah true i'm not eating antelope anymore it's not normal to me (laughs) um but i think it's really amazing to feel like you don't have to justify yourself to anyone and i feel like when i'm talking about food i have to justify it a lot i don't know why being a bit self-defensive it's a it's really contentious people get into huge arguments like um i've had I've had people come up to me and they're like, oh no, here's a good example. I was doing some field work with my friend in the York Peninsula. Uh, she was doing her honours research and we're going to um, look at how our nesting boxes was controlling mice population. So if we build more homes for owls, will they control mice on agriculture? So you're interested in owls, but it ended up with like looking for rats. <laughs> 
basically at the time my friend had started an Instagram page about like being zero waste in South Australia. Mm. She was posting amazing content, tips and tricks on how to reduce waste and like how she goes shopping without using plastic, blah, blah. She got bullied off of that page because people were saying that she wasn't vegan and because she wasn't vegan, she wasn't 100% zero waste. Now, she had <laughs> so many medical issues where she couldn't digest legumes. She had leaky bowel syndrome if she ate the wrong food. Like She caved in that night. She felt so much pressure by these people on Instagram. She ate vegan and ate food she couldn't physically digest and was up all night pooping blood <laughs> because of the pressure to change her diet. And this is what I Jeez. don't understand is this is why I'm nervous to talk about how I eat is because you can be having such positive influence in the in the community and you could be doing one thing wrong or one thing that could be improved on or whatever and people will hound you for it and she deleted the page because it was too like she was having medical issues from the expectations of her running this page which wasn't about her diet at all it was just about reducing waste like yeah. that's crazy right that was um well that's the thing in your own community there's like these sort of topics where people have very passionate views about it and so it's I a little bit controversial <laughs> controversial in the conservation space yeah. so you, your, your solution so far has been to mainly avoid these topics yeah i wonder how many people have noticed that i've done this i only talk about people i never talk about conservation issues on the page i never talk about my stance on palm oil or mink hunting or anything <laughs> like i would never talk about my stance on canned hunting and if i think it's good or bad i would never talk about any conservation issue because all around the world, conservation is perceived in different ways. There's different cultures. There's very contentious arguments to be had about everything. <laughs> and yeah. I, by avoiding these, <laughs> by avoiding talking about actual conservation issues, I've kept a largely harmonious community, which I'm so thankful for. Because if we just talk about our experiences, nobody can counter our experiences. Like, you can't say... You never went to Africa and taught cheetahs how to hunt. And I'll be like, what do you mean? Like, I was there. I know that I was there. So you're a dickhead if you don't believe me. <laughs> so it's like, end of discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but there might be conservationists who are like, oh, what a terrible thing to do, che teaching cheetahs how to hunt. You should have made them vegan. I don't know if anyone says that. <laughs> I don't know if people say that either. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's been interesting because I've been forced in the community to address some issues on a couple of times like so i've mentioned a lot how i'm really into animal ethics in the way of like tourism i really am passionate about that was a big part of your life previously yeah so here's a fun story before lonely conservationists i tried to run a community called heroic tourism which did not really take off, though I tried and tried. <laughs> it has like a better name, arguably. Everyone's like, Hero, they couldn't pronounce it. It didn't um. take off. <laughs> um, but so when I was in Madagascar, I was doing this study which compared um, lemurs in a tourist population to wild lemurs. And I looked at the impacts of like human contact and feeding. And long story short, the lemurs in the tourist um, facility, tourist park um they were the only population of lemurs to show aggression they had fur missing they were obese probably had diabetes so these are lemurs that like were fed by tourist humans yeah coming and going bananas which are so high in sugars and they calories worse, and they, they would, would just be so fat because they would be handed the food on a platter they yeah. wouldn't have to go and forage and like expend the calories like if they were just eating natural fruits and leaves it's less calories or if they're eating bugs I or something I it's high protein I relate to these lemurs <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an understandable position to fall into isn't it yeah to but sit around and eat all day basically the catch 22 was 90% of um, the forests in Madagascar were gone and the 10% that remained I think that was the percentages was only there because of tourism so that population of lemurs would probably keep their habitat because mm. of the tourism. But so my premise of starting heroic tourism was if we could all be heroes, 
while we go on holiday and make good decisions, like instead of feeding lemurs and going to these tourist parks, maybe hire a local guide to take us to a national park, stand at a distance, photograph them, um, not touch them, not pass yeah. on your bug spray to them and get chemicals everywhere. Like, yeah. if we can be heroes by going on holiday, we can both have normal behaving healthy lemurs and we can protect the forest. So my whole life which is which, which to be, maybe because i lived with you for a long time that convinces me that sounds like it'd be hard to argue against like let's have healthy lemurs that have a more and natural more habitat with more habitat like win-win. that would be better and you yes. employ more local people because yeah yeah you employ more guides and like if you have a I tourist never... park you could yeah. have one person going out and feeding a bunch of lemurs three times a day if yeah. you had constant not constant, but like within a reason, tours going out in different parts of the forest. Yeah. You could employ local guides to take smaller groups. I never understood people wanting like a bit of a artificial experience. Like if I traveled to Madagascar and it was like, hey, you can spend $50 and just walk into like 10 meters into a forest and there'll be lemurs around and you can like throw apples at them. <laughs> or you can go on this like thirty dollar long walk through you know this amazing forest and like maybe you see a lemur maybe you won't you know they're wild animals wouldn't to me the second option seems way more engaging no not but to, to people, most people it seems not no not because most the, people want the animal put in front of them and the then pat it. thing that you said of like maybe you will see them maybe not the maybe not is the real stickler for a lot of people like yeah. they want nature on demand which nature cannot offer well that's what i mean like they're wanting <laughs> <laughs> it's not nature at that point though yeah exactly like just just go to a zoo if you want to see it <laughs> But what I think is interesting is like, so heroic tourism never took off and I tried and I tried, but there's something about like trying to educate people with no marketable product versus now I'm just relating to people with no marketable product. And that seems better (laughs) to other people. It's a message people, at least some people are happy to hear versus heroic tourism where it's like remember that holiday you enjoyed and thought you had a magical moment with this animal it was actually garbage and you're a terrible person for doing that it wasn't it was like just be better it, no, it was just like <laughs> it was a pretty was, rough message you can hear. be a hero that's positive you are a heroic tourist yeah anyway in case any of you are uh, wanting to get that trending heroic tourism bring it back let's make it happen it's still a thing it has a logo <laughs> Uh, I took down the website because oh, it was too old. Yeah, It was too old? Well, like, I don't know. As I, the internet works. I just have... We've talked about this a lot of the time, but I like things to be organized and I'm a very minimalist person. So even online, <laughs> I only want, like, a I few can, things popping up. I can up. only have so many conservationist organization efforts. Well, I, I feel like if there's some outdated information and people come and they're like, Jessie, yeah. she's the founder of lonely conservationists and they see something outdated that i don't necessarily believe in anymore or like i'm not maintaining that so yeah i don't want something that's not maintained associated with my name well i was i was picturing potential drama with like if you go to like a a a zoo type of place and like like in australia you can go to a zoo and if you pay extra you can hold a koala I think that's a thing still, right? I don't know if you can anymore. And it's like... Maybe some places you can. In With your sort of... What your messaging is, wouldn't it be better to just have koalas just in trees? And or it's like, yes, but pay like... pay them extra to not let you hold the There's koala. some places... If, if this was in not in Australia, for example... Yeah. The only option is have a koala in a cage. Yeah. So like... But then, you don't then have then to becomes... hold it. Because I saw in Madagascar where there's lemurs... Like, that's where you find lemurs. Yeah. At a zoo, they were offering people to hold the lemurs and feed them a bottle of honey. You thought what? bananas were sugary. Oh. Straight up honey. And they're sitting... This is not even These in a tourist park. These lemurs are living park. the high life. So in the tourist park, I was researching it. They were like... It was basically at the bottom of a mountain. They had the whole bottom of the mountain to roam. They were not in enclosures or anything. This mm. was in a zoo. In a, like a stationary so, yeah, enclosure, no, like, in a cage. giving them honey. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And, and like people were paying to do it. So yeah. it was like every hour, I was like, "Here's your bo- another bottle of honey. Oh. Chug it down." 
when I was in Africa, I saw this really fat meerkat. It was just so <laughs> overweight. You've never seen anything like this. It looked like a 10 pin bowling pin, but like squished down. <laughs> it was very fat. Oh my God. Um, anyway, we kind of got off topic. I guess if we did have another podcast, it would just be talking about this. This Jesse would be ranting me. about the <laughs> conservation industry in general. <laughs> Basically, um, going back to community, I think what's been really positive is that when there has been times where so i guess what i mention is so this is why i mentioned the ethical tourism thing in the first place is that i'm really against on principle having photos with animals online you're against bowling pin meerkats <laughs> yeah i'm against bowling pin meerkats and as taking adorable as they them. are <laughs> um but in the beginning, I was so afraid of bringing any conservation value to the table because I, I was so afraid of getting into, like, drama. Well, you very well could have someone come along and who works at one of these places and it's like, oh my god, yes, I'm a conservationist, I relate to a lot of these things, and you're at a personal level being like, ugh, you're one of those people that make money from feeding meerkats <laughs> well basically like in the beginning i was fine with people having photos with animals it really hurt me to my core but like <laughs> i a lot of the people were showing photos where it looked like they were in the field i, mm. I would never post photos where it was like posed in a touristy way but because these people are conservationist and there was a range of different animals from birds to snakes to frogs i was like okay by the context of this is lonely conservationist and they look like they're all taken in the field, it will be fine. But there was one photo that changed this because there was somebody working in a baboon sanctuary that submitted a blog. They had a photo holding baboons. And this is like goes against all of my training working with primates, how we're never allowed to take photos of ourselves holding any monkey, primate, anything, because they're so cute and people will exploit that on the animal trade. And you're holding a slow loris. I want a pet slow loris. It's like... The black market on Instagram and Facebook for primates is so huge. Like, you can be like, can I buy a rough lima on um, Facebook and you can find one. So, I feel like after watching Tiger King, this is a very American problem, though. I think it is mostly American because... The idea you can like, buy a tiger in America and, like, that's not illegal is crazy to me. What's really interesting is, like, the difference in opinion of what conservation is across Australia and America and this is where this is why the drama ensued so I was <laughs> like yes I agree because uh, somebody told me like Jesse I really love lonely conservationists but if you're going to post photos that could have detrimental impacts to these animals I can't be a part of your community anymore respectfully Whoa. and I was like you're so right I know <laughs> <laughs> you're, like, you're not wrong I was yeah I was like I have been pushing so hard to preserve like my set like not even my sanity but i've been trying so hard to create a drama free space that i have been putting aside my own values to create that space to let people put and now well it's a bit push comes to shove and you have people being yeah like, oh if you're going to allow that that's almost a tacit uh that's anti-conservation values. that's yeah you're, you're encouraging it almost yeah so i was like from now on I will not post any picture with you holding, feeding, touching an animal. Like, because acknowledging, like, I have photos where there's giraffes in the background and I'm in the foreground. It's not. Well, that, that's it's not hurting the giraffes. <laughs> it's not impacting the giraffes. It's, but the giraffes and me are still in the same photo. So I didn't ban, like, people in the frame with animals. I just yeah. banned interacting with animals. Yeah. But I think there was a lot of Americans who had an issue with that because the perception of conservation in America is very different to Australia and England from my understanding um, where a lot of times it's better to put photos and say you have permits to handle them I think rather than just blanket statements saying do not do this we're not going to show any representation of the correct way to handle animal would you say there from... are there are situations where you need to pick up this cute little animal and look after it? Well, for me, I don't understand. Maybe let's take a selfie. I mean, this is probably going to cause drama again. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't understand. Be there's a lot of... Um, like, 
some people think it's okay to pick up lizards and take photos with them and turtles to take photos with them and birds to take photos with them there's the line for someone for some people is primates like they might have looked at so many lonely conservationists holding all like insects other things but the line for them is primates Mm. i never take photos of myself and share them of me holding anything unless it's an insect because if i'm gardening i think it's better to engage people in interacting with snails worms bugs um that that there's more positive benefits to doing that than to be like you don't touch them the snail is not too bothered I hope if so. If you pick them up, hopefully. hopefully. Or I guess, like, you pick it up a spider to move it out of the house. That's better than <laughs> just squishing it or something. Because even I feel bad because when I was in Madagascar and I was doing reptile surveys every day, I got so comfortable with the way that the wild animals were behaving. There was a time where I found a tree boa, uh, like a snake. <laughs> I picked it up, like a wild one. And there's a photo of me holding this wild snake. And I feel bad now that I had put that on the internet at some point because it's not... You probably shouldn't have picked up the snake. I don't want to promote that it's okay to just pick up wild snakes because there's instances where there was a baby boa and it was hissing and like... It was upset with you. I didn't pick it up. It just was... It was angry. Yeah. That we were even there. So I don't want people to think that you can pick up wild snakes because I had been doing reptile surveys every single day multiple times a day for six months yeah i felt like i understood the behavior of the animal but by putting that picture out there people would just blanketly see me picking up a snake and think it's okay i think most normal people who don't work with snakes will not think to pick up the snake well you never know (laughs) (laughs) but basically like this is the one time where i had to incorporate actual conservation values into lonely conservationists and it it caused drama like people were mad at me people were saying nasty things to the point where i almost deleted lonely conservationists like i almost (laughs) pulled the trigger and said this is not worth it anymore (laughs) if your feed is only people saying like you idiot (laughs) well it wasn't even that it's just like even people were telling me like jesse there's a group of people having this group chat about how shit you are. It doesn't make <laughs> you feel good. And like, it's not, I know everybody's saying, don't listen to people. Don't listen to people. The good that this page has caused is bigger than the words of a, a few people. But realistically, one of the arguments that was given to me was the bigger your page grows, the less human you become. And that hurt me. That really hurt me because I, a lot of people felt you're out of touch. I feel so... Like I'm putting my heart and soul into lonely conservationists. I tell people when I'm scared. I tell people when I'm hurting. Like I'm burying my soul on the internet. For people to think that I'm a bot or like yeah. like just a figurehead really disturbed me. That like nothing I could do could... Like if I'm already burying my soul on the internet and basing a whole community off of that, nothing I can do matters because if you can't tell that i'm a person when like i tell you when i'm scared i tell you that i'm struggling with the industry blah blah yeah like how, like how dare they <laughs> accuse you of being out of touch when like what more can i do to be in touch just you being if yourself? that's me out of touch so basically i just i th- sat for a long time i took a week off instagram because i, I was literally gonna g- give it up because that comment meant so much to me in like such a painful way that but then when i got back on (laughs) i realized the the reason why i keep this community and don't delete it it's because people were saying to me like jesse we wouldn't submit our deepest darkest stories to you for you to publish them on the internet if we didn't know you're a real person (laughs) like if you're a bot at the end of the day we wouldn't be giving you our stories as well yeah and then that really confirmed to me that that is a really fair point (laughs) why do i have almost like a hundred stories of global conservationists struggling that's really hard to talk about why would they give me that information if they thought i was just some person that was going to exploit them you know yeah just some corporate machine yeah um and then people were so lovely after that and they were just so supportive and it makes me it makes me so happy that I've curated this community where for the most part, people are incredible to the fact that 
like I people can publish articles about lonely conservationists and the only critique is you have no reason to be lonely or unhappy because nature is where I go to unwind. And then a lonely conservationist <laughs> will be like, excuse me, have you even read this article? I think you don't understand it. And then they read it and they're like, oh my God, I really, I misconstrued this. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like the, the classic only, reading of the headline only. The only like negative feedback I ever get from people um, on public articles is that they think I have no right to be lonely in nature. Well, like, that's exactly the mentality you're trying to battle. Exactly. The whole thing, that's the whole point. What was so weird is on LinkedIn, I, so if any of you don't know, I also publish your blogs on LinkedIn so the professionals can see your beautiful faces. <laughs> um, somebody commented on a blog and said, how, like, how can you be lonely? We are standing next to a beautiful sunlit tree. Be grateful. And I was like, firstly... That's not me in the photo. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> if you read the blog, you would realize that all of those beautiful trees are getting cut down. And that's why the conservationist is so like distraught is that she's dedicated her life to protecting a tree that is getting logged in front of her eyes. And he actually went back and read the blog and was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I take everything back. But it just made me feel so like miffed that a professional person would just do like a typical Facebook thing and like, just read look at the picture and make all these judgments yeah that's it's just sad. i think that's what a lot of people do in conservation like our friends and family or whatever might just look at our pictures or our instagram feeds and just like not really get the full picture like we could write a really amazing caption or we could like have content that constantly talks about what we're doing but ultimately we can't force people to digest the content in the right way or like to properly take the time to read it you know? <laughs> I guess not, <laughs> even though that's sort of the whole point. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because we got our first mum review the other day from the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Deb, Sapphire Hampshire's mum. And she mentioned in the review that she um, really liked the story, which I write at the end of the book, about my good, amazing, incredible friend, Spleen, who, when I met her... I thought she was the loneliest conservationist in the world because <laughs> there's this university near Ballarat, which is this small town in Victoria, and the university had no cars in the car park, no people around. <laughs> All I could town. see was her. And I was like, is this your life? Just you living in this tiny campus, like, on your own? And she's like, no, I swear there's other people here. I'm like... No, I didn't see another person for like the first three hours that I was there. Um, Because basically it's three hours from my house. So I'd never met her before. And she's like, I I remember commenting, writing on Instagram or something like, oh, we had a Victoria chat. And I was like, is anyone free? I'm bored. Like, I just, can I see one of you? Does anyone want to hang? She's like, I'm free today, but I'm all the way in Ballarat. I'm like, are you serious? Like, I will come to see you. Like, if you have a floor for me to sleep on. And she's like, (laughs) Yeah, sure. So anyway, I end up driving three hours to see her. Uh, I end up sleeping in her bed that night. Best night of my Not life. Not the floor. Like, Score. yeah, she's so amazing. She never met me before. She took me on a walk into the forest. She made me put an honorary log on a tree that had all these logs lined up like a little fort. She's like, everyone that comes into this forest puts a tree up here. And I'm like, I bet <laughs> this is a lie. But okay. <laughs> um, and then she took me out for dinner. And then I slept in her bed. And it was really cute. Like... Because <laughs> um, she's Sri Lankan and I'm obsessed with Sri Lankans. Even Lahiru, <laughs> even Lahiru that Todd was talking about having a crush on in the last episode is Sri Lankan. Like we appreciate Sri Lankans in this family. <laughs> um, so it was. It, we had a really incredible time. She's a really amazing person. Like um, basically, she messaged me a couple of months ago and she's like, Jesse, I have saved up a bit of money during COVID. And I really want to give it to a lonely conservationist who needs help. She had saved up $300 Australian. And she's like, just tell me a lonely conservationist. I want to give it to her. Firstly, amazing because she's a PhD student on a PhD wage. She had saved Not up... exactly Mrs. Moneybags. Yeah, in a pandemic, she's saved this money for the sole purpose of helping someone. Like, oh, my heart. <laughs> Coincidentally, that morning, I never look through Twitter. I'm like, I post on Twitter. I don't look through... <laughs> I must have been posting like a blog or something and that morning I saw a lonely conservationist 
who had been through a really rough time. She got kicked out of her house. She lost her job. Like her dad died, all this really horrible stuff. And she was talking about it and asking for support. And I was like, oh my God, I know who you should give this money to. Like I just saw this morning, coincidentally, this lonely conservationist in this really tough time. And she's like told people about it and um, she's really appreciating people's support. So in like a matter of hours, I had passed on this $300 and oh no, she wanted to be anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> the, the giver or the receiver? The giver. So I asked her permission if she wanted, like if it's been enough time and she wanted to have her name assigned to this good deed. And she said she still wanted to be anonymous. So I bleeped her name before and I've cut her name out of this story. So I really apologize to the amazing person who did this. I love you so much. And I'm sorry, I almost outed your hero identity. It's ancient history now. It <laughs> happened at least a year ago. I'm a bad person. <laughs> it was so recent as well. It's like a couple of months ago, just while I was reading, while I was writing the book, it happened. So I added it in the book. I didn't write her name in the book. I remember this happening. It feels like it happened two years ago. I no. guess that's just been a lockdown. This year. It's yeah. felt like a long time. Basically, it was so incredible to pass this money on to this lonely conservationist who really needed it. And it was like the most amazing thing to have her feel like she was appreciated and helped by the community. And I love that Saf's mum like, held on to that story and put it in her review. So <laughs> that's... Yeah. That's like one standout moment to me of like why this community is so incredible. Yeah. Makes my heart feel fuzzy. (laughs) (laughs) Another time was when there was, um, I talk about this in like every podcast I do, like not in this series, but like when other people interview me. Um, One time a lonely conservationist, before she was a lonely conservationist, was in a job interview. For whatever reason, was having a really hard time, broke down halfway through the interview, started crying. The interviewer um, consoled her, pointed her in the direction of the community and said, you're not alone. There's a bunch of people who can resonate with you and who can help you and you can listen to their stories. And then she ended up hiring her because she was a lonely conservationist. And so I get this lovely message from this girl like, I just had this interview and <laughs> I was told to come check out this This is how she speaks? Uh, I don't want to like... <laughs> in my head, it was like... I, you can imagine like a rain soaked person that has come into a really warm house and just been handed a towel okay. and I just felt so incredibly happy that like even a part of something I had created could help somebody over the other side of the world get a job and feel valid in, in her anxiety and it was my heart this community constantly does such beautiful things and that's pretty cool yeah it kind of makes it worth it because there is drama and there's times where it really sucks but it's, it's worth it for how incredible everybody is even my mum liked a photo <laughs> or something on Lonely Conservationist I had mentioned her or tagged her or I don't even know she might have just liked something and then she had like five new followers like there's this amazing thing especially when the community was new if you were represented on the community or tagged or like I posted one of your photos you would have like just 20 new followers because people are like you're in the community you're one of you're one of me now <laughs> like, yeah but even um my good friend Maria I shared her photo the other day and she's like Jesse after you post that photo of me saying that sometimes I feel like a flatworm I had like nine new followers like apparently <laughs> that's common to feel like a flatworm and I'm like it is <laughs> You're the first person who said it, though. And people are like, yes, give me more of this flatworm content. <laughs> so I just love how the community has, like, it's just become a safe space for people in the conservation industry. And, like, the fact that people are helping each other and communicating, collaborating, regardless of me, is just so beautiful. No. You know? Yeah. Like how when we first started creating the countrywide groups, and now there's even an LGBT group, and people can chat independently amongst themselves. So, like, if I have... A that was a tricky thing for a while because you were just... Most people on the Instagram page where it's just you posting things and it doesn't really feel like a community if it's just you 
announcing. Well, I didn't know it was going to be a community. I just thought I'm posting a blog. Oh, so originally I asked my friend, I was like, I have this idea for a blog. And she's like, yeah, but you should create an Instagram page to get people to your blog because nobody just looks at blogs anymore. No one's going to come across a random website. (laughs) So the Instagram page's sole purpose in the beginning was to direct people to the blog. Mm. But then people started connecting on the Instagram. The Instagram became its own thing. Um, So that's why I had to create the DM groups. But then um, they only fit 35 people. So then I had to move over to Discord. (laughs) (laughs) So it's been like a journey because if I knew Lonely Conservationist would be what it is, I don't think I would have chosen Instagram as the platform, you know? Yeah, it's not conducive to community building. Todd wanted us to have a Reddit, but I don't know. I don't well, I said Discord Reddit. or Reddit, they're pretty good for communities, but they're a bit more like nerdy. I think the Discord is okay. The problem is, is that there's not a continuous chat. And so some people across different time zones have a hard time have like sustaining a conversation but then i've noticed like the other day somebody had a question somebody responded and they solve a problem so maybe discord is just good for like i have one specific thing yeah let's work on this yeah it's uh, there's some discord groups that i see where there's like tens of thousands of people in the server but like the chats aren't really that busy because because when you have so many people you're you feel disturbing like, all yeah of them. <laughs> I better not just you know if everyone throws in their two cents about every single yeah. line it must feel like then no one says anything though yeah true well you can mute different servers because I have like one for each country and then for different subjects and like I really wanted to make it a community hub where if people want to get more involved they can have like their own I can just make a channel for them um there's even a meme channel and a place to promote your project because what is getting really hard for me is like I have 4,000 people following me on Instagram then if everyone come to me say can you please promote my conservation project number Mm. one I don't want to get involved with sharing conservation content because that's not the the focus of this page yeah two I can't share 4,000 people's content. So I created the Discord. Like so, equally, yeah. Yeah, so people can share and promote their blogs, their websites, their YouTube pages, their projects, independently of me. Yeah. Because, like, I can't be a community notice board for conservationists. Like, that's just not what my content is. Yeah, it won't work. Yeah. So, sorry if I've ever said, do it yourself on Discord, but that's why. <laughs> that is the actual <laughs> mechanical way that you do it. Uh, I think it's interesting as well because Todd a lot of the time will be like I'll be really frustrated with something because I feel like I have a lot of people I'm responsible for a lot of people and sometimes I feel like in the beginning I didn't really know how to manage the Instagram page because I'm not really a social media user I don't have a Facebook I don't have like any social media account with my life on it I have a bird page (laughs) I have Lonely Conservationist page there's no like Jessie's life what does she do this weekend page you should all find jesse's bird instagram page where it's exclusively photos of birds there's a snail recently (laughs) and a snail the odd snail the odd snail um but because i've never been really into social media i didn't really understand how to manage it and keep my mental health in check at the same time like i would post every day now thankfully i take weekends off it's sort of crazy how, like, yeah, just sitting on your phone using social media feels like a full-time job. Yeah. Like, to an amazing degree. <laughs> to, what, to, to me or anyone else, like, that's not real work. But, like, people... This is the thing. A lot of people, like, get a social media manager, and I can't because the thing is people have contacted me in the DMs and we've had really emotional or like personal conversations. And if I just switch the owner of the account, then they will assume that it's me and they might say something really vulnerable or person like personal to a stranger. And I can't live with that. Like, <laughs> and I've noticed that I have to say things a lot of times. I feel like I'm spamming everyone, but people might not see things until I post it like the fourth time. Like yeah. one of my closest friends didn't even know we had a YouTube channel. Like, you just... Sometimes you miss things. Um, So, I don't feel like I could confidently let everybody know that it wasn't me on the other end of it. Right. And Really what you need is, like, a way to sort of, like, split up all those sort of personal requests to, like, the wider community. 
Or would, would you, that's why do you I still to prefer discord. the personal touch? I love the personal touch. That's what makes Lonely <laughs> Conservationist so special is because it's something I deeply because care about. Because it's really about. just Jesse. <laughs> it's Jesse. It should be Jesse. The lo- no, somebody actually messaged me being like, to the Lonely Conservationist. And then I saw someone in public and they're like, are you the Lonely Conservationist? The... <laughs> like, it's just me. I am the Lonely Conservationist. Yeah. Um, but I think there's what kind of makes the page so special is that I'm there to be like, I'm hurting too, I'm scared too, I'm like frustrated too. It's not just, here's a page with tips about how to cancel imposter syndrome. It's like, here is someone that can validate your feelings. Yeah, an actual human being on the other end. Yeah. Not just, yeah. And then they validate my feelings because I'm like, I'm scared. Or what did I say the other day? I said, oh, I was so afraid of talking to my mentor because last time we talked two weeks prior i had been like i don't want to do this i want to change my life direction then i decided this is like a professional mentor i don't know how normal it is for people (laughs) to have a mentor i'm a part of this uh coalition wild mentor program where there's like i've been looking for a mentor for years because i've been just fumbling my way through life and because i've not been in a structured job or an academia or anything i didn't have somebody to guide me (laughs) Sometimes you ask me for advice on like how to do this stuff, and I don't know. So I finally got uh, a part of this um, conservation-based mentor program. So if you want to be a part of it, a mentor or a mentee, check out Coalition Wild and be a part of it next year because it's really good. Um, so I was like so afraid of talking to my mentor because I wanted to change my life direction again. <laughs> <laughs> In my brain people were disappointed in me for being turbulent or like indecisive or like a roller coaster when I didn't really think about that's how just life is. Like I don't have to make a decision and stick with it. I can try different things. So after I spoke with him and he's like, Jesse, you don't have to decide this or this. Like you can do both. Like we can make it work. It's fine. And afterwards I was like, I don't know who needs to hear this to my Instagram community. Um, But just because you change your life every two weeks doesn't mean that's bad. Like, you are allowed to live fluid, like, variable lifestyles, and that's okay. And Just keep doing you, fam. I feel bad about it, so I don't know if you guys feel bad about it, but it's fine. You're all fine. And then so <laughs> many people message me afterwards, like, you have no idea how much I need to hear that today. Uh-huh. And so it just makes me feel good if when I'm going through something turbulent and like at least six people agree with me that they're also going through it, like that makes me feel better. <laughs> Why would I hire a social media manager to take over when I lose my like justification? <laughs> Community people who cheer you on, probably. <laughs> yeah, like I will be your cheerleaders if you be my cheerleader back. <laughs> That's kind of the relationship we have going. Okay. <laughs> But I remember, weren't you a part of like a a My Little Pony support Instagram network or something back in the day? Not Instagram, like a forum or something? Yeah, good times. What? So you had like that community experience too, just in another facet of the internet? Yeah, well there was a time when the internet people really loved My Little Pony, like (laughs) unironically. (laughs) Do you know, the people at my old restoration job found out that you like My Little Pony and they're like... Do you know Jesse's going out with a brony? Yeah. <laughs> and then I would get harassed for the rest of my time working there. <laughs> it's a good show. <laughs> so if anyone sees the discussions or anything like on the YouTube channel, you might see Todd's like my little pony stuffed toy in the background of my like in my desk. Like <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's not in my it. desk. It's like next to Todd's desk. But I feel so embarrassed that it's there. <laughs> <laughs> it's more normal for you to have one. It's like, no, it's not. (laughs) Um, I I just want to say Todd has, that's, he just has this one toy and he doesn't watch it religiously. It was a gift as well. Yeah, it was a gift. He's not like a diehard brony. He just used to enjoy watching it with his friends sometimes. It was a lot of like lonely conservation sort of weird online community. Like everyone was just on the same page. And, like, cared about the same thing. You didn't have to justify that you weren't a brony. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Because if you talk to anyone else, they're like, oh, just even the concept of liking the show, like, how dare you? (laughs) (laughs) But to these people, you could be, like, not just, you know, not insulted, but also even just talk about it and stuff. Yeah. 
I've never seen the show, so I can't pass judgment on that. I'll have to good force you to watch it. <laughs> That's our next podcast series. Yeah. Is like me being forced to watch and do commentary on my little Just Pony. reacting. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, why did that peter out? Like, what was the end to that? The show stopped being good, so I stopped watching it. <laughs> oh, okay. So, was it mainly like a you discuss episodes or. It was just inter- It was just mainly internet culture of like sharing memes about what happened that episode and like okay. people making fan art. But yeah, like you said, there was like my little support group. Oh yeah, where people that's would have problems of. and people like, man, I was really struggling in life. And yeah, I would comment on a lot of people I'm like, oh, you're doing okay? How can I help you out? <laughs> that's cute. But then I think it gets to a a stage where this is where I have issues. I'm not a certified medical professional, and that. If you create a space that's open for people to talk about really troubling things, I and none of the community are well, like this is a broad general statement. There might be some people in there that are generally the community aren't trained to know how to handle things like suicide or mental disorders or like if it gets turbulent to a point where people are replacing actual help with the community, then it gets really challenging for me because I have been in situations where I'm about to lead a, like I used to work in a forest teaching children, the school bus of children were about to come and I'll get a message saying that there's like a turbulent situation in one of the group chats and it's like really horrific. And like, (laughs) yes, I'm the leader of, the community but i don't know i'm not trained to deal with this i don't know how to deal with this yeah. my bus of school kids are coming yeah. like, um it's just challenging sometimes because it's not anybody in the community's responsibility to help anybody and it's lovely that they will but there's like a line to where it stops being appropriate or like it starts becoming taxing more than yeah maybe. well we had a few times of like my little pony support group and people would go in there and post about like yeah i'm about to kill myself and it's like come on man (laughs) yeah (laughs) what do you expect people on the internet to practically help really if they're if they're posting it online obviously it's just a you know a call for help and attention really well you can't say obviously well (laughs) (laughs) i don't want a blanket statement anyone's pain no, 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 no. Well, I'm, I'm sure they are going through legitimate pain, but there's like all the all the advice we would only give is like, well, here's a phone number. You, you have a really useful person on the other end who can give you a lot more help than like you know someone commenting with a text to reply. Yeah, and that's why I have the mental health resources on the website because I can understand the name lonely conservationists would bring in. Yeah, like maybe people who are already a bit unstable and already not totally mentally healthy so just in case there are resources for all over the world that people can turn to if they need to take actual like proper action i think most people can comprehend that like going to learn a conservationist like it's okay to talk about but like you you won't be getting super serious help and advice with like depression and stuff yeah do you want to know some tea though My most common email that I get is from drug companies or mental health companies who have found me through the mental health page. They're trying to get listed on my list. Oh, they want to be on the list. Yeah, and it's all people who, they're like, we work with people who are like, have uh, alcoholic, they're alcoholics, we can help them. And I'm like, lonely conservationists aren't alcoholics. That's not a trend you've found, is it? If they are, it is not because of the conservation life. Well, I've been... Well, I mean, sometimes it is. <laughs> I was very drunk for a lot of my time in Africa. But I mean, like, is is separated. Like, people who are conservationists, their alcoholism is not really relevant. Like, I'm providing mental health resources to help them with the problems that they may encounter in conservation. Like, people keep soliciting me. They're like, oh, if your community has drug issues, like, we can help you. Please add us to your list. And it's all like all these other facets of mental health that I'm not really involved in. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're a company trying to get on my mental health list, 
just stop contacting me unless you are like a generalized like helpline no specific things about <laughs> drug overdoses alcoholism took too much viagra like that doesn't apply to me <laughs> yeah like it's, it shouldn't be this one page's <laughs> responsibility to like funnel you into the exact psychiatrist and they keep hounding me they keep being like hey i see you didn't reply to my email <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and they send me like five emails like just tell me to stop if you don't want me to reply and i'm like no it's easier for me to block you <laughs> if i got a weird view of the world that i'm like oddly suspicious of like a the mental health organization that solicits lights yeah going out of its way to advertise its services i don't know i guess that's fairly reasonable that's but just like the way they're doing it yeah yeah but they don't understand the context obviously like the group is called lonely Con- conservationists it's not called alcoholic conservationists yeah drug do we need a community for conservationists who are struggling with alcoholism they think so is it <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. See, this is what people don't see. The other side of running this community is the solicitation of drug companies, the really turbulent mental health crises, people wanting to promote their You would have to, like, go through them and, like, vet how useful they are before you probably confidently put them on a page as a recommendation from you personally as a place to get help. Even blogs. If you're a person who wants to tell me a story about how successful you are sorry it's not going on the blog oh and yeah like some people will misunderstand what the blog is even I'll about i'll tell you my story about conservation how amazing i am no <laughs> yeah they just see it as self-promotion which I, it's, it's a little bit but i've only ever except for one turned away men <laughs> it's always been men who can't write about how they've struggled well men don't have problems <laughs> don't they do well no like it's I, it's it's a stereotypical thing but it's a it's been my experience of like women are a bit more oh the world's against me oh everything's so hard i can't believe it and That's... men are much more like oh i'm i can i'm better than the world i could kick the world's ass yeah that's right what i am the best what me out is that you embody the first perception of women that i'm you... much i this is, Definitely much more feminine than I am masculine. <laughs> I mean, it's hard because I ask people, I always give them the opportunity to re- rewrite. Well, you've noticed this trend of like men are actually underrepresented in the blog. Yeah. And in your community at large. I keep having to reject them because they keep trying to say how good they are. <laughs> but like surely there's men out there who are having problems in conservation. Yeah, of course there are. But, like, is it really... Like, how, what percentage of blogs are men? Less than 50. Less than 50? Mm-hmm. Okay. But there's, like, probably more than... It's probably more closer to 50-50 in the industry. Maybe mm-hmm. men just don't have problems. Well, it's inter- I give everyone the opportunity to rewrite the blog. Oh, okay. One amazing person, Elliot Connor, shout out to you. He was 15 years old when he submitted his blog, and he still... He ended up writing his blog about how I kept rejecting his blog. <laughs> the biggest <laughs> problem he's had. It's like, people don't take you seriously when you're 15. And I was like, no, it was what? just too promoting your content. It was just too positive. That's a bit understandable then. But it was, I love how he was like dissing the community, like yeah. dissing the blog in his blog. It was like, at least you hit the nail on the head yeah. in the theme. Like, that's fine. Bring me down. <laughs> <laughs> but like, no other man, I don't think has rewritten they haven't, yeah. I think, it's a, I don't know if they're a bit butthurt or they think like, oh, I actually don't have the story that is needed to fit the criteria. I'm not sure. Well, didn't you have a bit of a, a theory of like men just aren't willing to talk about It's not a struggles? theory because I asked the community why there's why? not 50-50 <laughs> yeah. blogs. And a lot of men came forward to say that they were either scared of the male toxicity and backlash from men in their life or they had published and had experienced that and so it's challenging because i get into this bubble where everyone in my life is from lonely conservationists so i think everyone's going to be nice and dandy but like Mm. if you're a lonely conservationist it's not true that every 
person on all your social media is also understanding sympathetic and empathetic about what you're going through and they might be like oh little johnny having a wine men are afraid of this i'm not going to stereotype and say all men but a lot of men are afraid of the backlash and the male toxicity that comes along with uh being vulnerable on the internet and so they just make the decision to not tell their story and i know some people who have written in their blogs they've been watching lonely conservationist for like a lot of the time like a year and a half and they finally after seeing a lot of men uh publishing their story then they will come forward and they'll tell this because they can see the benefits of it so even if people are dicks to them they can acknowledge the good things that come along with sharing your story cuz there'll be someone who reads it and it's like oh wow it's not all just roses there was one person i was like whoa your story is really like this other guy's story and he's like yeah that's why i felt confident to tell mine because it was so similar to his and he didn't get any shit so i can <laughs> so i think is it's really important for men please submit your stories i know it's hard um but you're changing the conversation and making it accessible to talk about this kind of stuff and your story might touch a nerve with another guy who might also feel empowered to speak up as well because i know a lot of um like men's charities and stuff all focus around mental health men's mental health is mm. a huge thing because there's a huge stigma about being tough and not crying so <laughs> if we can use lonely conservationist as a platform to break down that stigma and to like comment really positive beautiful things on men's blogs and just like hype them up for take like if there's a guy who has the balls to write a story everybody in his life is saying horrible stuff but all the all the comments that are public are really positive that's mm. at least going to show him that it has been respected and well received by the people that matter yeah yeah <laughs> at the conservationist yeah so i think like for me a big part of the community that has been so touching has been the blogs like there's so many blogs that have resonated with my own life like i basically there's three blogs i think that have been submitted that could have been about my life <laughs> <laughs> like and it's just so reassuring to hear somebody else go through something that you've gone through because then you're like oh i'm not alone everything's okay because it's not just me that's experiencing this yeah and it's not even like you need a immediate practical solution to these problems is just the, the idea that other people also have them yeah it's reassuring it's reassuring also because like i talked about this in the mental health episode but there was a blog that really highlighted some of the trauma i might have had and it just to feel like it was validated that i was i could i'm allowed to feel that way just cuz somebody else had been in the same situation and they felt that way that was really important to me So these blogs are having such a profound impact even on me. <laughs> That's really selfish like. <laughs> <laughs> really all of this is just so Jesse can uh, feel better. <laughs> feel better about her life. Well like technically that's why I started it, right? <laughs> yeah. I started it because I wanted to know if I was alone or not and I guess I'm not alone anymore. None of us are really lonely conservationists. But if I change the name I don't know. The name tells a story. It's the origin story. Cuz some people are like, we're not lonely anymore, so you're going to change the name and I'm like, <laughs> um, <laughs> to keep the purpose a bit. I think like there's a something I talk about, maybe I don't know if I mentioned it in another episode, but lonely conservationist doesn't really fly well with professionals, but when I release the book in a podcast how to conserve conservationist cuz it's more solution based flies a bit better. Mm. So I think like lonely conservationist is great for the blog. but if i'm ever to do something practical like workshops or develop any professional or personal development from this maybe it will come under the name how to conserve conservationists instead yeah well cuz yeah. i didn't expect this to be a thing i just was lonely and i was a conservationist i wanted to tell my story <laughs> okay. now so many of us oh my god <laughs> i think What are the best moments of the community? I feel like this is like a wrap up highlights reel of my life. <laughs> Do you remember when that Canadian guy did a podcast all about the Mongo Bay article? Oh yeah. And I so there's a a Canadian marine biologist who made a podcast called Speak Up for the Ocean Blue. And on the Discord chat someone's like, "Oh hey, I found you from this podcast." And I was like, "What do you mean? What I was cuz usually I'm a guest on a podcast." But yeah. this guy just made a podcast literally about this article that we're in in Mongo Bay and he did like a half an hour just talk about how 
he he never related to anything more and he like he he found my work so meaningful and he's like go check him out and I listened to it like three times walking around the block <laughs> <laughs> being like oh my god it's just so crazy to think that what I've something well, I've got done, to sort of experience it for, for, at a personal level with him like discovering what it is and relating to it yeah and it was just so insane that something I'd done as like some small Australian nobody like <laughs> some like Canadian knew who I was and was publicly talking about me yeah, but I bet like thousands of people have come across learning conservationists and reacted like he did basically and like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is life changing. This is like my people. And like, you know, they just don't record half an hour of them talking about it. Yeah, so you don't hear it. I don't get to experience They might that. just comment being like, oh, this is great. <laughs> yeah. Know, thanks guys. It was just so amazing. Um, I think <laughs> another crazy thing, I was in an article, it was... They contacted my personal email and I don't know how they got it, maybe from LinkedIn or something, but they messaged me like, hey, do you want to be in this magazine? And I was like, okay. They just asked me five (laughs) questions and I thought nothing of it. The article ended up being about like leaders in conservation where Greta, Jane Fonda and all these amazing people were mentioned in this article and I was like the last person mentioned <laughs> but just to be like alongside them in the same article you were in the same article a bit, a bit grounded by the fact that you were the last person mentioned I deserve to be the last person you would be mentioned. weeded out if you're above any of them like oh, it was crazy like how? Because I just thought nothing of this, like, it wasn't, like, a face-to-face or a phone call interview. It was just answering They didn't tell you what questions. it was for. They just said it was for this magazine. Wow. I didn't know what the article was going to be about. And it was just so incredible to be, like, Greta Thunberg, Jane Fonda, Jesse Panazzoli. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> Do you feel like uh, media attention like that sort of takes away from the community aspect and makes it more about you? I, it sounds like you enjoy that. <laughs> no, I. This is my predicament. I never wanted lonely conservationists to get big for the sake of getting big. I didn't want it to get big at all because I knew that the more followers, the more people in the community, the less interaction I could have personally with everybody, and the less like I couldn't develop these relationships. In the beginning, like everyone was friends. When you get to four thousand people, not everyone can be best friends. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and also I never wanted to be the face of the community. I wanted the community to speak for itself. But the problem is if I'm asked to speak in an interview or for an article or something, they put my face and name on it. Like it just happens. It's not really up to you. Yeah. It becomes about me and I don't want it to be about me. Um, I think that takes away from the community, but in the end, like I created something and I'm the person that I, that needs to talk about it because I know about it because I'm working on it like it's challenging because so I'm not only doing media stuff I'm talking at scientific conferences I'm like talking with people on the phone I'm talking (laughs) but like I'm talking with so many people what I enjoy is when I think I'm like really shit and (laughs) I don't enjoy when I think I'm shit but like I am really struggling I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere I'm like I don't know what to do. I feel like I've talked to 60 billion people about my options. And then somebody would be like, have you thought of this? Yes. I talked to this person on Friday. Have you thought of it? Yes. Have you talked? And people are so impressed by the fact that I've talked to such a wide diversity of people. And You're like, I, I'm across it. I already have a lay of the land. I know my options. I <laughs> like have all this information. They're like, it's impressive that you... Like, why haven't you just done something already? Like, you've talked to all these people. <laughs> why do you feel like you're struggling and not knowing what you're doing when clearly you've just done everything? But people are impressed with the diversity of reach or, like, the fact that I talk to everybody. I'm not just only talking to you if you have X amount of followers or you're this media company. I'm talking to scientists. I'm talking to students. I'm talking to whoever you are, a mum, a lawyer. You're, like, you're talking to some person who worked at Dell, yeah, like the computer company for some reason. Yeah, she was at the. Um... Like, how did how does that come happen <laughs> when you're just trying to make learning conservationists better? She was at the pitch event for this incubator program I was at last year, and she commented on the feedback form. Do you have to be a lonely? Do you have to be a conservationist to be a lonely conservationist? Ooh. 
Um, controversial statement because she really resonated with what i was talking about but she wasn't a conservationist per se but she does care a lot about animal welfare she's always like posting petitions and like really heavily engaged on social media and basically she got in touch with me again this year and we ended up just chatting uh, a bit regularly about things and it's just good to have her perspective from an insider corporate like landscape sort of a normie level well like because Dell does amazing things for education and for the environment they have a she manages the sustainability program so this i argue that she is a conservationist but i, I think yeah. because she worked for Dell and <laughs> she wasn't in the it. field she didn't think that of herself yeah so it actually is very empowering for me to talk to her and to make her believe she's a conservationist. Because in my eyes, she is. Like, David Attenborough says the future is educating women. She's yeah. educating women. <laughs> like, amazing. And I think it, like, so I don't just have my Lonely Conservationist community. I, since creating Lonely Conservationists, I've formed a community of quote unquote conservation psychologists who don't like that term because conservation psychology doesn't mean what I want it to mean <laughs> but they basically work on their PhD uh, they are either finishing their PhD or finish their PhD uh, and working on factors that impact conservationists and I will meet with them like once a month to chat about things and then then I have like the lady from Dell and the master's student we meet regularly to talk about so I'm always forming these communities because communities is the way you get information and you share information and it's so powerful so i just encourage everyone to not restrict your interactions based upon like preconceived notions of what someone can give you or what you can get out of it i think we always have something to learn or something to offer even if we don't think we do I sound really confident. Okay. <laughs> but basically, after talking to the woman from Dell, she's like, wow, we should talk regularly. Like, I learned so much. And I was like, what I said to you, like, I've known my whole life. Like, like I, nothing I didn't, groundbreaking I didn't to you. think it was important or revolutionary information, but from she'd never heard it before. Yeah. She also commented on the failure wall. She participated in that. Like, she, she loves the concept of, like, talking about failures. And actually... A note, someone messaged me the other day wanting to connect about something and she's like, just looking over your website, the thing that stood out to me most, the failure wall. So <laughs> impressive. I was like, thank you. <laughs> Some impressive failures on there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just love how Lonely Conservationists, I think, taught me to... There's Everybody has something to offer. And I'm just going around stealing them. For <laughs> <laughs> Combining it into a <laughs> highly distilled advice and help for everyone. Well, if everyone is... So if everyone in the conservation industry is really like segregated and competitive, they're limiting themselves by restricting their knowledge and restricting their resources. If I am talking to lots of different people from lots of different diverse backgrounds i am using their knowledge i'm obtaining their knowledge and i might have more access to their resources like it's a life hack <laughs> and basically i want to i want to reduce competitism com competitiveness what yeah. competition i want to reduce competition um and increase resource sharing and community forming in the industry I think it will solve a lot of problems so I encourage you if you feel like it's not fair that I have so much knowledge and resources because of all my interactions try interacting with people too because I, would I was about to say other how people does, to do that. if you're just subscribed and you feel like you're not really involved in the community you just it's just a page you follow and you want to get into this uh, inner circle <laughs> The oh, whole community is, is the inner with. circle. Like, for every single person that DMs me, I will DM them back. <laughs> like, I have relationships with people in the community. And some people are like, how do you do that? Why do you waste your time doing that? Because the community is not a waste of time. Like, the I, whole point. that is the whole point. Like, you are all so valuable and special to me. And I think the solution to having 
a more incredible conservation industry is we should be becoming a better and bigger community. Um, if you want to share your projects, you want to collaborate more, you want to find people in your area, head over to the website, click on chat to LCs. There you'll find the Discord page and you can chat to whoever you want from around the world. They'll answer your problems, you get involved. <laughs> um, if you want to know more about like my personal struggles with Lonely Conservationists, if you go onto the Patreon page, I every week do a recap of my actual process in developing the community. And I don't actually know how long I will do this for, but basically <laughs> for, like early on in the, like one of the first people I asked for help is like create a Patreon page. Like what's the worst that can happen? You get no money. If you like get some yeah. people supporting you, that's something like you've got nothing to lose. Just do it. I decided what I could offer is to bring people along on my journey with me. So every single week from like the very beginning, I have been talking about the struggles, the positive, like everything I had done that week to bring lonely conservationists further along. So <laughs> at the, in, in the form of a five minute video, usually yeah, vertically recorded, on vertically your phone. recorded on my phone. I'm always in my hoodie with wet hair <laughs> <laughs> on a Wednesday morning. It's a very frank and open uh, discussion Yeah, it's what you did that week. It's basically like you're in my kitchen with me in my living room. We're having tea and biscuits. We're on the couch and you're there having <laughs> <laughs> you're having this conversation with me. You're like, Jesse, how's your week been? And I tell you. Um, so that is a way to, to kind of see it from my perspective of like the drama, the tea, <laughs> the hard slogs, what I'm thinking, how I'm going to develop the community, what I'm going to change, what's going on, like... That's your ticket in inside me, <laughs> inside of me. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, Todd actually controversially, I wouldn't let him. I wouldn't let him watch the videos. So he actually started well, paying who, for patience. Who are you recording these videos for? Because you refuse to record them if I'm in the house, in case I hear you talk about it. <laughs> but if you're saying such intimate things that you wouldn't want me to hear. How are we putting it on the internet? So Todd actually started paying to see the video. Yeah, I had to pay money to see the video just to see what you're talking about. But then he recently withdrew his support. Yeah, because I'm not going to just send you $10 a month <laughs> to know what you did that week. But I already now, know. now he's been missing them. And every week he's yeah. like, Jesse, I really missed your video this week. I do though. Because <laughs> Todd also used to travel for work like yeah. a lot so he would like to hear what I've I would actually miss out on what you did that way <laughs> so that is like there's lots of opportunities to connect and collaborate with people and I think a big part is like going onto the blogs and finding people who resonate with you and reaching out to them and finding your like-minded community because they've shared a part of their soul on the internet so you can really find out who people are what they've been through their backstory and see who resonates with you um what else? There's so many things. <laughs> <laughs> so we used to, until now, um, do lonely conversationist discussions where I would give people the opportunity to come and connect with professionals in the field and discuss conservation psychology topics and be a part of discussions and workshops and try to alleviate imposter syndrome. Because Which seems like a really great idea still. It was so great, but I wish more people came. You only had like a handful of people actually attend. And it was so disheartening because the content that was shared in Lonely Conversationist discussions, which you can access all the discussions on the YouTube, uh, Lonely Conversationist. Um, Maybe if people can't spell it and they can't <laughs> find it. You can't, because they're all recorded. It's just the workshops that weren't. But the discussions really shaped the way I go forth in conservation and the workshops gave me so many incredible tools to reflect. Like, I don't think we reflect enough. <laughs> um, so I think we just, we need to learn from people and listen to their stories. One of the um, discussions was on race uh, that happened in Black, the Black Lives Matter week and um, or Black Lives Matter, the month that it was really, I think it was June, where it was like the top of Things everyone's mind. Heated, yeah. Um, Sean in that discussion said, "What you can do is just listen to people, just listen to their stories." And I've really held on to that. And ever since, I just believe the power of listening to the blogs, listening to people on 
if they have podcasts or YouTube channels or Instagram stories, just listening to people is the solution. And I think we'd all be a lot happier if people listen to us, you know, like if... Yeah, stop shouting your opinion. <laughs> start listening. Listen to other people's. Because I must say, like, I'm really sorry to anyone who I know personally who has listened to any of this podcast and you've never heard me talk about any of this with you before. Because some people have been a bit upset that I maybe could have had some of these conversations privately and they could have changed their behavior or like um, something could have happened from these conversations, but I never talked about them because I didn't think that it would be listened to. So if we start listening to people close to us that we kind of forget to listen to, like if Todd and I are just hanging out in a house all day, yes, honey. <laughs> like if we actually take the time to listen to each other, it's only going to be beneficial. So I think the outcome of this episode is just listen. And thank you for listening to us. Speaking of. On that note. <laughs> we only have one more episode left. As, as we only talk and not listen. <laughs> yeah. And we, we speak over each other a bit. I remember yeah. the feedback from the first episode was like, I love how you and Todd listen to each other so well. And I was like, do we? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we do. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening to what we have to say. Because I don't know if this has been talked about before discussions between people from a conservation and a non-conservationist point of view um so i don't know if this is new information i don't know if this is just very how to appreciate jesse information because i'm really only speaking from my own opinions <laughs> that's all we can ever do that's all we can do so listen to your friends listen to your family talk to people join communities and <laughs> let's share <laughs> collaborate and stop the fighting it's a very large call to action. Bridge the gap. So that was the second to last episode of How to Conserve Conservationists. I hope you have enjoyed coming on this journey with us. We have one more episode to go, so join us next week for the final episode based on the final chapter if you want to keep reading more content though you can head over to the blog on lonelyconservationist.com check us out on instagram at lonelyconservationist or twitter at lonelyconserve and even consider checking out my cringy updates at patreon.com slash lonelyconservationist and remember if you buy the book please rate and review and i really appreciate it i will see you next week bye